This is David Lurier from Pasadena, California. In this video, I will discuss the CT interpretation of lumbar hernias. These are not ventral hernias, but rather are dorsal hernias, which occur in a very small area inferior to the 12th rib and superior to the iliac crest. When we draw the muscles of the lumbar region over these skeletal elements, we see that the latissimus dorsi, shown here in yellow, covers the majority of the remaining muscles of the lower back. There is a gap, however, between the external obliques in purple and the latissimus dorsi where they both intersect the top of the iliac crest. A dorsal hernia through this inferior lumbar triangle was first described by Jean-Louis Petit and this was published in 1783, more than 30 years after his death. And while Petit's hernia is a superficial hernia, there is a second superior lumbar hernia, which is a much deeper hernia, and in fact is covered by the latissimus dorsi. To see the area of this potential hernia, first described by Grinfeld in 1866, and soon thereafter in 1870 by Le Shaft, we must remove a portion of the latissimus dorsi and look for the inferior border of the 12th rib. If we zoom in, we can identify the boundaries of the so-called superior lumbar triangle, often more of a quadrilateral. In blue here, we see the 12th rib, which forms its superior border. There is a serratus complex, in this case it's the serratus posterior inferior, that also forms a portion of this superior border. Then medially, we look for deep inside the quadratus lumborum in red, and superficial to this, the erector spinae complex here in green. Its lateral border is formed by the internal oblique, which you see in blue here. The external oblique muscles, shown here in purple, also come quite close to this border. It's important to remember that the superior lumbar hernia is not a full thickness hernia. Like a spigellian hernia anteriorly, it has a roof or covering, in this case the latissimus dorsi, over it. Here you can see Petit's hernia, and on the patient's left side, you see the floor of Petit's hernia is the blue internal oblique. To fully recognize the pathology of lumbar hernias on a CAT scan, we must first recognize normal cross-sectional anatomy of both lumbar triangles. Let's start with the superior lumbar triangle. In this axial scan, we see posterior to the kidney, on the left side in blue, the tip of the 12th rib. The quadratus lumborum is in red as another border of the triangle, and of course the latissimus dorsi in yellow forms the roof. The floor of the superior lumbar triangle is formed by the very thin aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis. An additional finding, if you look at the descending colon, beginning at the white line of Tolt, look at that thin microfascia that extends beyond the greater curvature of the left kidney. This is the lateral conal fascia attaching to Gerota's fascia, and interestingly, you'll see later when we look at hernias, the lateral conal fascia can often herniate through Grinfeld's defect to form what we call a pseudosac. Now if we take a look at the coronal view of the same patient, you can see on the patient's right side, the blue tip of the 12th rib, quadratus lumborum, the latissimus dorsi, all delineating the superior lumbar triangle. And we can see the same, of course, on the other side. In the sagittal view of this patient, we can see the iliac crest. A little higher, we see the blue tip of the 12th rib. We see the quadratus lumborum the latissimus dorsi forming the roof, and of course, this is what the superior lumbar triangle looks like in a sagittal view. Now let's look at normal CT anatomy of the inferior lumbar triangle. Again, in the axial view, of course, we see this patient has a large incisional ventral hernia. But let's focus on the iliac crest here. We see a bit of a gap and a weak spot on both sides. On the patient's right side, we can see that the gap is between the 
superficial external oblique in purple and the latissimus dorsi in yellow as they approach the iliac crest on this side. Comparing this CT scan cut to our previous anatomic illustration, we can see that the yellow latissimus dorsi is medial, the purple external oblique is lateral, and the floor of this triangle of Petit is formed by the blue internal oblique musculature, which is quite thin as it fuses with the medial thoracolumbar fascia. Here on the CAT scan, we also see what anatomists and surgeons approaching from the outside don't often see, which is that the quadratus lumborum in red forms the medial internal border of this Petit's triangle. In the coronal view of this same second patient, Again, focusing on the iliac crest, looking at the right side, we see the external oblique, and it forms a free inferior border with a gap between itself and the iliac crest. You can see the thin muscle separating the inside fat from the outside is the same internal oblique. We also see a little bit of the quadratus lumborum as it attaches to the iliac crest in a coronal view of the inferior lumbar triangle. In the sagittal view of the same patient, we see near the iliac crest the thin internal oblique and thoracolumbar fascia. We can see because this cut is quite medial the latissimus dorsi in yellow. We do not see the external oblique inserting on the iliac crest because we're too medial. However, the external oblique does angulate medially as it attaches to the lowest ribs and here you can see that in purple. Notice that again the latissimus dorsi is forming a roof near the area inferior to the 12th rib. Inferiorly, at the area of the inferior lumbar triangle, there is no covering of latissimus. Now that we have covered normal CT anatomy of the two lumbar triangles, in the next segment, we will put all of this together to better understand CT imaging of true lumbar hernias. In this portion, I will focus on the key steps to CT interpretation of primary lumbar hernias. We will start with the superior lumbar or Grinfeld's hernia. Here you see the 12th rib up high. As we follow this distally, we can see that at its tip, we begin to see an abnormal herniation. In magenta, we see some serratus posterior inferior muscles, which also form an element of the cranial border of this Grinfeld hernia. On the patient's right, we see the flat, unaffected latissimus dorsi in yellow. On the left side, the latissimus is pushed out in a large convexity over the herniated contents. I call this the latissimus balloon sign, and this is quite pathognomonic of a Grinfeld hernia. Clearly, there is something focally pushing out at the roof of the latissimus dorsi. As we follow this more inferiorly, here we see a cut of the kidney in the same axial view, and this is quite common. Here you see the psoas muscle in blue, the quadratus lumborum muscle in red, and the erector spinae complex in green. Importantly, notice how the lateral borders of the red quadratus lumborum line up in an anterior-posterior plane with that of the erector spinae. Incidentally, note as we discussed in the anatomy section that the lateral conal fascia between the descending colon at the white line of Tolt and Gerota's fascia at the kidney is actually herniating as a pseudosac into the Grinfeld defect. Next, we will begin to discuss one of the key points of this video, and that is you see as we scroll inferiorly toward the iliac crest, the quadratus lumborum begins to extend well lateral to the border of the green erector spinae complex. In fact, we're already down to the area of Petit's triangle, as you can see. On the left side, you see a little bit of the iliac crest already appearing. Look how far out the red quadratus lumborum is extending compared to the green erector spinae. This was very different than we saw at a little bit higher level in the Grinfeld's area, where the quadratus lumborum and erector spinae lined up at their lateral borders. So we'll continue scrolling down toward the pelvis. You can see the iliac wings. And then let's take a look at the same patient in the coronal view of the Grinfeld hernia. Let's focus on the 12th rib on the left. So we'll follow that out as it goes distally. And there's the herniation just inferior to the tip of the rib. We see the latissimus balloon sign, the quadratus lumborum. And if you look closely, you can see a little bit of pseudosac herniating out with the contents.
Looking down at the top of the iliac crest, we also now recognize Petit's triangle, no hernia. Now we'll take a look at a patient with a real Petit's hernia, and I'd like to thank Dr. Nico Cazada for this next CT series. On the patient's right, posterior to the kidney, you see the distal tip of the 12th rib in blue. You can also see a strap of the serratus posterior inferior in magenta. This is attaching to the 11th rib. And now moving into the superior lumbar triangle, we see the latissimus dorsi in yellow. It's overlapping the purple external oblique, and you see the blue internal oblique layer, quadratus lumborum and erector spinae complex, all outlining nicely for us the superior lumbar triangle. Now let's compare that to our anatomic illustration, where we can see the muscle groups and the colors correlate very nicely with our CT findings. Note again that even though this is a different patient, the quadratus lumborum lateral border lines up with that of the erector spinae at the level of the superior lumbar triangle. As we scroll inferiorly, look at the latissimus dorsi overlapping the external oblique, and then they begin to gap apart as we get very close to the iliac crest, forming the opening of Petit's triangle. Here you can see the quadratus lumborum is also extending well lateral to the border of the rector spinae, and this denotes the inferior lumbar triangle, and you can see herniation of bowel and fatty contents right through Petit's triangle. So you see in several different patients now, we've used that relationship between the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum and the rector spinae to determine if we're in the inferior lumbar triangle area or the superior lumbar triangle area. Now with this insight, the interpreter should be able to distinguish whether a primary lumbar defect is a Grinfeld or a Petit's, even if only given a single axial CT slice through the defect in question. As we continue to scroll down in the Petit's, you can see the bowel herniating with contact with the iliac crest. You see the last bits of attachments of the quadratus lumborum bilaterally. The internal oblique floor has been disrupted. As we move more anteriorly and leave the lumbar area, you can see all of the obliques are attached to the iliac crest. Here in the same patient in a coronal view, let's take a look at the quadratus lumborum. You can see Petit's hernia here above the iliac crest. You can see again as we move anteriorly, the external obliques are attached to the iliac crest. In conclusion, in addition to recognizing the traditional surrounding structures, I have emphasized the quadratus lumborum muscle, which is, though underappreciated in the published literature, in my belief, the key, reliable, orienting landmark of the lumbar region. To summarize, in a superior lumbar hernia, find the tip of the 12th rib, look for the kidney on the same axial cut. Using the quadratus lumborum landmark, the QL and erector spinae borders will line up in the same AP plane and look for the latissimus balloon sign. For inferior lumbar hernias, you will see contact with the iliac crest, look for the gap between the external oblique and latissimus dorsi, and for the quadratus lumborum landmark, the QL will be far lateral to the erector spinae lateral border. Thank you for your attention.